We're thrilled that you could join us for tonight's rescheduled event. For those unfamiliar with queer stories, it is the brilliant brainchild of Sydney artist Maeve Marsden, who has produced these live storytelling events around the country for the last six years. Queer Stories now boasts an incredible archive of LGBTQIA storytellers with nearly 300 stories on their award-winning podcast. Tonight's lineup of six brilliant storytellers are just the latest editions. Some important things to know about me as your host, I am an Aquarius with Aquarius Rising, a human design reflector, and I contentiously believe the order of favorite Spice Girls should go scary, ginger, baby, sporty, posh. <laughs> I know, I said contentiously. <laughs> But most importantly, I adore queer stories. I have been an audience member many times and told my very own queer story back in early March of 2020 in the before times. But most, uh, so if tonight is your first time with us, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. Prepare your loins to be delighted. And if you've never, be, and if you've been to queer stories before, welcome back. I am so very excited to get to hold space with all of you. Now, Without further ado, our first storyteller. Zenobia Frost is a writer and poet. Her most recent poetry collection, After the Demolition, won the 2020 Wesley Michelle Wright Award and was shortlisted for the New South Wales Premier's Literary Award. In 2020, she edited Art Starts Here, a book on the history of Metro Arts Theatre, and in 2021 debuted an interactive installation at Dots and Loops Festival with Timothy, Timothy Tate. Can we please welcome Zenobia? We've got a challenge microphone, I'm very short. Thank you very much. Right, thank you so much, everybody. Um, facts about me, uh, my pronouns are she, her, I'm very short. Uh, Tories, a Taurus, Taurus rising, a uh, bit of Aries in the sun, a lot of this. Uh, Spice Girls definitely sporty first, then all the rest. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to tell you a story about the before times. In fact, I'd like to tell you a story about a time that lesbianism triumphed over the patriarchy. It's just a little story, but to do so, let me take you back to a halcyon era when air travel seemed possible and plans could be made securely in advance. The year is 2015. My Bessie and I have decided we're going to see the world or at least eat our way through Germany and Italy for a couple of weeks. The Sorrento homestay is the tour of choice for those of us too introverted for Contiki pub crawls and too nervous to trek alone. It's a family villa on a lemon farm and the whole place smells sunny with citrus and olive oil. A rooftop view of Vesuvius, homemade lemoncello. The trip begins like the setup of an Agatha Christie novel. Picked up from Naples, our tour group gets acquainted via Memento Mori in Pompeii. There are the newlyweds from New York, the vegan professor who asks endless questions about how the food is sourced, the retired day drinking Kiwi dairy farmer who didn't want to die without catching a plane, the hip young family with one teenage daughter and a charismatic Grey's Anatomy style doctor who'd like to think this story's about him. There's of course my bestie, my actual gal pal, Tani, who everyone assumes is my girlfriend. At this stage in my life, in 2015, it's funny that Tani and I are radiating bisexual energy this hard, given she is straight and back home I have no less than three boyfriends. <laughs> Side note, I feel like when I talk about my history of polyamory, I sound like my dad boasting about smoking a stack of weed in the 70s. 
Anyway, I didn't inhale or whatever. So back to Sorrento. There's also Tiffany, who's on this trip as a little treat to herself for graduating from college in Ohio before she starts her grad degree. One might call her a witty and vigorous all-American girl. She's so sporty gal next door, it's not funny. And she is, in fact, in the room next door to us, cursed to share with the eco-professor. No doubt this trip has ballooned out into something even more idyllic in my mind in its pre-pandemic memory bubble, the last time I was on holiday. But this place is probably where I'll go, where I'll die, provided I've been good. To get to the beach, we walk through the lemon trees, wind down the hill through olive groves and veggie gardens, and down ancient stone stairways. Most importantly, there is a bartender on the beach. The closest in age of our motley crew, Tani and Tiffany and I are immediately inseparable. The beach bartender mistakes us for Berliners, perhaps it's flattery, and suddenly German is our common language, shutting everyone else out. We're laughing on deck chairs wedged into sand, drinking spritzes, and then we're floating in circles in the shadow of bright little fishing boats, tipsy and beaming. We can see the doctor looking, and for now, it's funny. On his deck chair, he is sinking martinis and cruising tinder. To divert to him for a second, just a second, he's a Canadian surgeon in his 40s, though he looks younger, with a real puppy dog thing going on and a penchant for holding eye contact. <laughs> he's careful to ask me about poetry, what with his ancestral love of Sufi, and to quiz Tiffany about tennis, and our tour guide, pretty Leah, about her hometown, where, he has Googled this, the accordion was invented. <laughs> I figure I might sleep with him. Hey, I'm on holiday. But there's no rush. There are day trips to monasteries and long seafood lunches on the shore and terrifying rides around the city eating watermelon in a glorified long golf cart. And we're finding out why the grumpy dairy farmer is traveling and Tani is making endless Campari spritzes with big slices of orange. We charter a boat to Capri and swim in the Tyrrhenian Sea, so blue it's a cliche. And while my bestie is hurling last night's lemoncello off the side, I watch Tiffany stretched out like a cat drying off in the sun. That night, after another long dinner on the farm, the doctor waits until it's just him and our trio of firm friends left with the drinks. And true to his perceived age, I guess, he suggests truth or dare. We girls share a look. Sure, we'll play along. This is how I learn that Tiffany has never been with a girl and would like to. The doctor and I both take note of this. All right, interesting, good to know. <laughs> and then he uses this line on me that I've never forgotten. You, he says to me. You don't need to be seduced. <laughs> it's such a Mills and Boone chocolate-coated red pill. But I'm ashamed to say 2015 me was kind of into it. Fortunately, this is also how we learn he has slept with hundreds of women, which would be fine. That's fine. If it weren't for the fact he has never had a sexual health check. Never. He's a doctor. <laughs> Track back to the note about how many boyfriends I had stashed away in 2015. I also had a standing quarterly check-in with my GP. I scanned for the clap like I was on the lookout of a pirate ship, shimmying up the mask with a telescope. Still, 
bro is oblivious. He's focused on Tiffany's Katy Perry cherry chapstick status. But you've never had an experience with a woman, he says. Or maybe with a group? Do you think now's the time? We shrug. Maybe. And we retire to bed. And over the next few days, I guess you could say we got off on withholding. The doctor is like a puppy trying to hump a leg, any leg. Swimming, we splash him away. Our tour guide calls him a tumor. <laughs> He's slipped on that tightrope between Casanova and Lothario pretty quickly, not getting what he wants. And no number of half-asked questions about Sufi poetry can make up for the whole definite chlamydia thing. <laughs> and Tiffany is all long glances, shared caprese salads, little shoulder touches. And finally, it's the last night of the Sorrento stay. The farmer is returning to Footrot Flats. The professor is returning to Portlandia sketches. Tiffany will start her master's degree in Indiana. And Tani and I will return to Brisbane, where I cannot even begin to tell you how many boyfriends it takes to initiate literally one orgasm. <laughs> no one wants to leave. We're all on the patio till late listening to music on the surgeon's Bluetooth speakers I won't be able to afford for another five years. And then finally, it's just him and her and me. He looks at us like tonight's his night. He's so certain all his pestering has finally paid off. We're tired, we say. Good night. And Tiffany and I, in psychic agreement, walk calmly off, not towards our rooms, but into the lemon orchard. And under the stars in the olive grove, we are very much alone, and she gets her missing college experience, and then some. <laughs> and for a couple of years, connected across the weird distance of Facebook, we exchange tiny dyke nods across the internet, with Tiffany tagging me now and then in obscure news about the history of lemons. <laughs> and the doctor? I can't remember his name, but I really hope he got that shit checked out. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Clear stories, Kogoma. <laughs> Are we all now equally longing to go to Sorrento homestay? I feel like a lemonade. I didn't know that was the romance that I needed, but it was. Thank you, Zenobia. Busy Lavelle is a queer waka waka writer and performer. She is a burlesque dancer by the name of Busy Body, and she has published for Indigenous X, The Guardian, Junkie, and Vice. Can we please welcome her? Uh, cool. I guess following the same pattern, my star sign is a Leo. Um, I think I'm too young for the Spice Girls, but my favorite member of Little Mix is Leanne, and my favorite member of One Direction is Harry, <laughs> and my BTS bias is Jimin, <laughs> uh, and my pronouns are she, they. <laughs> According to Twitter, the five homoerotic love languages are intimate stabbing, outright obsession, confused pining, no one knows me like you do, and lifelong promises that always sound suspiciously like wedding vows. <laughs> when I was nine, I found a TV show that combined all of these pillars into the one story, and since then it has been one of the most consistent things in my life. It's a story about sacrifice, a story of love and war, a story that asks how far you're willing to go for the ones you love. 
The story isn't Shakespeare or Austen, but it is indeed a literary great. It is the tale of a boy who has a nine-tailed fox trapped inside of his body as he tries to make his way through the ninja world. The story is Naruto. And I know what you're thinking, how is an anime about child soldiers homoerotic? But I assure you, Naruto is one of the queerest pieces of media I have ever consumed. Within the first three episodes, Naruto and his rival Sasuke have kissed. Before the episode count reaches double digits, we're introduced to a trans character named Haku. And then Naruto spends the majority of the anime's 720 episodes chasing after Sasuke, <laughs> vowing, promising to bring him back to the village, declaring that no one knows Sasuke better than he does, that their relationship is different. The two of them end up being part of a long line of reincarnated gods. One, the sun, and the other, the moon. Different, but always tethered to each other. And I'm not making that up. <laughs> the first time I had bisexuality explained to me was when I was at school. I was 12 years old, and it was from a girl named Alex who was a year older than me. She loved anime just as much as I did, and I met her because she and her girlfriend, Caitlin, studied Japanese in the weird room that the school shoved all of us distance ed students in. I was meant to be studying Chinese. Alex told me she was bi, and I queried, what's that? It means you like more than one gender, she told me. Huh, I think that's me. And it was as easy as that. We had sleepovers and we read fanfics and fan comics when we should have been studying. They introduced me to a few other animes and also showed me that characters in fiction didn't need to end up with or be shipped with characters of the opposite gender. And to be honest, this did take a moment for me to challenge within myself, because both of these characters already had girls that were so interested in them. So why wouldn't they end up together? Years passed, and I lost contact with Alex and Caitlin, and my, uh, my relationship with Naruto became complicated. I still liked it, but it wasn't cool anymore. So I convinced myself that I had outgrown it. That was until curiosity got the best of me when the final chapter dropped in 2014. When the final chapter came around, much like Harry Potter, everyone in the main cast was in a head of a marriage and also had kids. It was disappointing to see characters pure, paired up purely so that there was a next generation. It was particularly baffling because by the time that the final chapter was released, Naruto and Sasuke had kissed more times than either of them had kissed their canonical wives. <laughs> At this time, I was still spending time regularly in the dark and slimy dungeon that is Tumblr.com, so even if I didn't necessarily agree with a certain pairing, I could always just find people who thought the same way, or explore what this series would have looked like if Sakura had married Eno instead. My Naruto phase lasted a while, and it definitely got me through the first part of 2020. The second part of 2020, however, had myself and my younger sister searching for new animes to watch, curious if anything could itch the scratch that Naruto did without us having to suffer through another rewatch. And lo and behold, I found Haikyuu, a story, ball, a story about the epic highs and lows of high school volleyball. A continuous theme in Haikyuu is that of connection. You connect with the volleyball three times before it goes over the net to the enemy's side. You connect with new people, both allies and rivals, through this game. And through this volleyball anime that is oh so dramatic and also very gay, I have had the pleasure of connecting with people too. One of the first friends that I made on anime Twitter, or Annie Tweet, is someone who loves Sanrio plushies and lives in a time zone that's two hours behind ours. This person is someone that I genuinely love with my entire heart, and I can confidently say that just because you're in different countries and you've never met IRL, it doesn't make the friendship any less valid. We've spoken about sexuality and gender, health, uni, and they let me endlessly complain to them about the mischaracterization of certain ships and characters. We also both hate the way the Netflix originals seem contractually obliged to have a sex scene in every single episode. They wrote a fanfic that I honestly would buy a print copy of if I could. It was an exploration of asexuality, something so painful, beautiful, and personal, all laid out and embodied through a high Q character. I have another friend who lives in Pakistan, and we speak regularly about our uni assignments, or what I'm writing that week, and what site it would be published on. They helped me realize that my gender existence and expression isn't binary, 
and they've seen a lot of my burlesque videos, and we regularly send K-pop memes to each other. Then there's a group chat that I found myself in last year, and we all live along the east coast of Australia. The thing that brought us together was, you guessed it, gay anime volleyball dudes. <laughs> in this group, I've received endless cat pictures, duolingo memes, advice for sensory overload, the, the important history of the pink triangle, an appreciation for Hatsune Miku, and friends who put up with the hypocrisy of me being awake at 3 a.m. by telling them to go to sleep. Lastly, one of the closest friends that I've made on anime Twitter lives in San Francisco, but we talk every day. I talk to this person sometimes more than I talk to my siblings, which is already a lot. We watched and cried over a Rina Sawayama livestream concert together from two opposite parts of the world. We spam each other with art and fake recommendations and have one brain cell bouncing back and forth between us as we headcanon or make up scenarios about whichever pairing or character has our interests at this time. This person is one of my best friends and they made it click to me how important and integral the theme of connect is to Haikyuu. Two of the main characters that I really adore, Kageyama and Hinata, first connect on opposite sides of the volleyball net. Kageyama is angry at Hinata's wasted potential and Hinata is devastated over a loss, but he vows to win the next time they face off. A few weeks later, Hinata and Kageyama are now teammates and declare to each other in a room full of people that they've just met that they're invincible so long as they're together, which is very dramatic, very gay, and suspiciously sounds like a wedding vow. Anime's always been so important to me, and having friends who have similar interests is equally as important. A fire lit inside of me back when I met Caitlin and Alex in our weird language classroom, and I've been lucky to find other friends like them over the years. Growing up, any shows that were popular were killing their lesbians every second week, would have girls pretend to be gay for popularity, or have really harmful depictions of queerness or bisexuality, and that is when they weren't afraid to use the word bisexual. Tuning that out and finding the gay subtext or homoerotic undertones in anime was just easier. And there's definitely issues with homophobia and sexism in anime and manga, and I certainly don't need to tell this crowd about the issues of representation because we've all lived it. But there's just something so special about how in 2017, ice skating anime, Yuri on Ice, posed the question, fellas, is it gay to exchange rings with your homie in front of a church? And that makes me think that regardless of how good representation and live action comes, I'll never walk away from this medium. Because every time that I return back to a Naruto phase, as cringy as it is, it feels like a calming and peaceful return to home. Because through Haikyuu, I found ways to connect with people who are so alike, but live different lives in different places. Because I found a place where my biggest interests and one of the most important things about me cohabitate, and I genuinely couldn't feel happier or luckier. Thank you. Um, busy, I will have you know that I played volleyball in high school and I wish it had been as cool or gay <laughs> or emotionally expansive as you described. <laughs> Sadly, it was not. <laughs> uh, Michael James is a teacher, writer, producer and the current entertainment editor for Q News magazine. In 2011, Michael and his husband came to prominence as part of the Rip and Roll campaign that gained international attention and spurred his involvement in queer activism. He has served on the Brisbane Pride Festival Committee for nine years. In 2011, Michael and his husband became parents to a nine-year-old boy through the Queensland foster system who went on to become a permanent part of their lives. He has written about this experience through his blog, two dads and me. Please welcome Michael. Don't think this is going to work. Uh, now I'm going to adjust it. All right. That should do us. All right. Uh, my name is Michael James. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I live uh, in Wanjiraba country, uh, over near the Gold Coast. Um, I hate to tell you, Claire, but sporty spice all the way. Uh, I'm a Cancer with, I think, a whiskey rising. I'm not sure. Don't know my star signs very well. I'm sorry. 
Um, but I'm here to, tonight to tell you a little bit of story about my family. Um, now, as Claire mentioned, my husband and I uh, became foster carers about 10, 11, a long time ago now. Um, and during the course of that time, we were writing about some of the stories, the things that took place in our life. Um, so this is just one of those stories from a time in the early years when our son first came to us. Um, you'll notice in the story I refer to him as Flash, just to protect his identity when we're talking about him in the media. So the story goes like this. It's called, I Want to Be Like You. Now sometimes it's really easy for people to forget that the child who walks and talks beside us hasn't been there with us forever. Now obviously strangers on the street, they wouldn't know any better, but plenty of our friends and family know that he hasn't been ours since birth. Yet, this doesn't stop them from dropping some of the silliest one-liners that kind of make us shake our heads. You see, our son Flash has a specific fascination with a pop star that's, well, somewhat contentious to those with a more discerning musical taste. Now, when I say fascination, I may be lying it on a little lightly. Obsession may be a little bit more of an accurate description. The artist in question is one Justin Bieber. Yes, that's right, the hair-flipping, high-voiced, baby-crooning, panty-dropping teen superstar of the world. Our boy is a believer. He has the Bieber fever, and we realised pretty quickly that there was nothing that we could do about it. <laughs> In the scarce collection of belongings that he brought from his old house to ours came a throng of Belieber material. Not one, but two. Two copies of his movie on DVD. His albums, posters, and even, wait for it, the doll. Yes, there was a JB doll, pint-sized and plastic, just like the boy it was created from. <laughs> but this was somewhat of a shameful obsession for Flash, one approached with great trepidation. According to his peers, the Beebs wasn't the coolest person in the world. Well, not for the boys, anyway. So his approach was always like his own little coming out. He had to test the waters and poke and prod and search for reaction first. The first time we met him, we asked him about the things he enjoyed. He said, oh yeah, I like my bike and my cars and stuff, and I like music. What sort of music do you like? Silence. Well, you know Justin Bieber? Well, I don't like him at all. Uh, he's so lame and all the girls love him. His youth worker at the time casually raised his eyebrows at us with one of those looks. We smiled. Really? We've heard he's really popular. Lots of people like him. He looked up. Yeah, well, I do like some of his stuff. He's kind of cool. An admission that was like releasing an avalanche for him. Well, that's pretty cool, isn't it? We said. You could see the relief of the burden of the judgment kind of wash over him. You see, his obsession was different to the ones that I had over pop stars as a kid. It wasn't like that time that I scrimped and saved to buy the Hanson video of Tulsa, Tokyo in Oklahoma, um, so that I could replay it over and over and over again to decide which one of the boys that I wanted to be my boyfriend. Or like the NSYNC and Backstreet Boy posters that adorned my walls as a teenager and the slight obsession I had over Nick Carter for the better part of a decade. <laughs> this was more of an idle fascination. He truly looked up to the Beebs as someone that he wanted to be, or at least be like. In all of the intricacy of his childhood and his search for attention and acceptance, he was just thinking, if I can be like this guy, well, then more people will like me. He'd done the math. Millions of girls like this guy, so wouldn't it make sense to be like him? If he could master the magic of the Beebs, then surely more people would love him, right? So fast forward and we had a small barbecue with one half of our family shortly after he'd moved in. Now once he had them gathered in the house and he was feeling sufficiently comfortable, he figured it was time to pull out his signature moves for the family. Um, excuse me, can everyone stay here for a minute? I need to show you my dance. His captive audience awaited. The music started. Oops, no, wrong song, wrong song. Just wait, just wait. Stops, starts, runs out. And what followed was very impressive. 
He entered down the hallway. Baseball cap pulled down over his face. Plastic guitar strung across his back. Stops, head down, dramatic pause. The head slowly rose upwards as he stared at his adoring crowd. The performance was upon us. And he knocked it out of the ballpark. He had memorized the top Bieber moves. The air grab, the pointing at the adoring fans in the audience, and even some of the actual um, choreography. And bam, the hat flew off, he ran, he jumped, and he slid knees down on the floor, pulled the guitar around in front of him, did his best solo effort, and everyone in his adoring crowd cheered appropriately. The song ended, and the whole family applauded. Wait, I have to show you my next dance. So he went in and he proceeded to play a different song and enter the room dramatically again, performing the same exact dance. Move for move. <laughs> Just to a different song. His repertoire was strong, but it wasn't diverse. Now it turns out this was a habit formed at school of all places. On Fridays in a somewhat show and, show and tell style segment, they're allowed to choose things to show or do for the class. Now, apparently, it had become a ritual that on Fridays, he was allowed to perform his dance to the class. The exact same dance every single week. <laughs> uh, to their credit, his classmates never mocked him or teased him, and in amongst all of his anxiety and swirling mass of thoughts and ideas in his head, he had the confidence to get up and do it week after week. So finding different ways to shift his thinking, engage his understanding of how people digest and perceive him was and still is an ongoing process, but an important one for him. And later down the track, he would end up in speech and drama classes that saw him thrive, like one of his fathers, he seemed born to perform. But, <laughs> What was frustrating at times were those little things that sometimes people would say, those little what the fuck moments. After they'd see him dance, like he would do it for strangers that he had just met if we would let him, um, would hear the odd laugh or smirk, things like, clearly you can see he's learning from you, or apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, eye roll. <laughs> this would all be well and good if Perhaps, you know, we'd raised him from a baby, but these comments could sometimes be really deriding our confidence in raising him to be his own person. Not to mention our general disdain for Justin Bieber and our combined talent of being terrible dancers. <laughs> this part to him was all him, and those comments served to almost strip him of his own identity by playing it back onto us. He'd had nine years to formulate his own personality, which was thriving. And to have anything flamboyant about it, thrown back to the fact that he now had two gay dads, was kind of ridiculous. But the comments would never come with malice. They were always in jest, and it was usually from those we loved and treasured the most. But still, they added more weight to the growing complexities of raising a very energetic young man in a world where all eyes were on us. Now, let's be honest. It's not like we walked him up and down the house to teach him how he should walk. I mean, could you imagine it? Nope, faster, head up, move the hips from side to side, put some sass into it, and one, two, three, strut, be fierce, where's the pout, point, hair toss, laugh, now sissy that walk. Is that what they thought that we were doing? Who knows? But as the years went by, we watched him growing and developing, and of course he did pick up behaviours from us. We heard his language start to shift, his vocabulary and his enunciation start to change to become more reflective of ours. It was one day I was sitting down cross-legged and I looked across to him and he was sitting beside me and it was almost comical. Subconsciously, he was sitting identically to me, legs crossed, book in hand, just completely engrossed in the pages. My very own little mini me. But he is his own person and cultivating his own identity, piecing bits together from the world around him. Now, whether those bits and pieces come together to make a straight man or a gay man or woman <laughs> are irrelevant. The only thing we hope is that they create a confident person capable of being whoever and doing whatever they put their mind to. Maybe he'll be the next Bieber one day. Who knows? Anything is possible.
Okay, Tiger Macy is a passionate activist and has worked for community groups including Tropical Fruits, Acon, mental health organisations, community galleries, community radio, animal rescue and more. They enjoy practising art, poetry and other forms of writing and are always looking to learn new creative outlets. Tiger lives with ADHD and chronic illness. They are very passionate about making the world a safer place for everyone to be able to be themselves, especially those who have faced stigma. Tiger loves to attend kink events and connect with the kink community. Tiger Pup has been making friends and going on adventures since 2013. Can we please welcome Tiger? The theme of the night was circus. I was in a cute lion costume. Tired after a long night of play, I let my friend know I was going to chill in the pet crate. My intention was just to have a lay down somewhere I wouldn't be expected to talk. Plus, the crate had a fluffy dog bed in it. So I picked up my chew, to chew toy and headed over, but my plan was flawed from the beginning. See, I had forgotten to account for the fact that Tiger Pup loves making new friends. And when in a space she knows is safe for her to be herself, we'll usually do so the first chance she gets. By the time I had lowered myself onto all fours, crawled through the door of the pup crate and turned around, my hands were no longer hands, they were paws. I was already in pup mode and I was quite unprepared and I didn't even have knee pads on which I paid for proudly with grazes later. So I did all I could think of doing in that raw and beautiful headspace. I sat there pouring at the door of the cage, unsuccessfully trying to pull it towards me. I did so contentedly for what felt like several minutes until one of the lovely staff members came over and closed it for me. As they went on their way, I wagged my tail in thanks. I turned in a circle a few times before curling around my toy. After a few minutes or so of comfortably napping, my energy levels started to rise again. My toy suddenly seemed to be calling for me to christen it with a few good chews. I booped it with my nose before swiftly grabbing it between my jaws and shaking my head from side to side. I even bumped the end door of the crate open and vaguely realized that it hadn't been locked. Once I felt my prey was defeated, I started to chew on it trying my best to nail the squeaker to create that satisfying sound. I alternated between resting and playing until a pair of legs approached the crate door. A lovely human crouched down and smiled at me widely. Hi puppy, do you like pets? They asked, knowing the importance of consent, even with a nonverbal pet. Arf, I barked, excited by my new companion and wagged my tail enthusiastically. I pressed my head up against the side of the crate. Good puppy, they cooed as they stretched their fingers through the metal. It's hard to pat you through here, they said. That's when I remembered the end door of the crate was open. So I turned around, pressed my head against it and walked forward so the door of the crate swung open. My new friend approached me and I wagged my tail. Would you like to come and sit at the feet of some lovely people? They asked. Ruff, I barked, and I did a little dance, lifting my front paws off the ground. Come on, pup, they laughed as they headed off across the room. I stopped to grab my leash in my mouth and pushed it towards my new friend. Seeing a beautiful, kind human on the end of my lead instantly makes me feel safe and at home. It tells me that I am loved and cared for, but it also makes me feel brave. Like, if they were in danger, I would protect them. So it's safe to say that by this point, I was in heaven. After that, any remnants of human thoughts were long gone until after I came out of pup space. At their feet, the simple but powerful act of having my head petted made me feel safe and comfortable. I pressed my head up into their hands before lowering myself on the floor. 
An acquaintance had seen me and whistled me over, calling out, Tiger Pup. My head pricked up and I bounded over to say hi. Oh my gosh, Puppy has a name, I heard my new friend say behind me. And after a few pats from my acquaintance, I headed over to the new group again for some more love. I played and sat there, lapping up attention for the rest of the night, even until people started to leave, patting me on their way past. Hi. For me, pup play is a non-sexual kink. For some, it is sexual, which of course is also cool, because I would hope that by now, we all know not to yuck anyone else's yum. Tiger Pup has been in my life for as long as I can remember. Kids love pretending to be animals, and I just never grew out of it. I would tie myself to the clothesline or the leg of a table, and I've always loved being on the floor, even since before I needed a cane for fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. The best floor place to lay was on the rug in front of the fireplace. But like most quirks, it got to the stage where I was bullied at school for it. So naturally, I started to hide it from people. In fact, I kept it mostly to myself for my teenage years. Then I turned 18 and was introduced to both the kink community and the idea of consensual non-monogamy. Finally, my life made some sense. I was over the moon when I realized there were other people like me out there. And better yet, there were safe places I could go where I could be myself and engage with others who accept all of me. Being able to express that part of me safely with other people and pups is such a blessing and doing so gives me a deep sense of purpose, fulfillment, and joy. Over the years, I have used pup space as a safe haven to go to, even when I've been on my own, because sometimes I just need that break from the human world and my human brain. I even have tiger pup dreams where I'm in a biological dog's body. It's fun. I have always felt tiger pup changing me from the inside making me braver, friendlier, and more fun. She has no social anxiety, no anxious thoughts, or self-doubt. Tiger Pup doesn't catastrophize or, over or stress. She isn't scared of the dark. She doesn't overthink. She just is. Life is complex, and it's important to slow down. Headspaces such as Pup Space are similar to a meditative state. When in pup space, I am practicing the mindfulness techniques of participate and one mindfully in the moment. This, I believe, is one of the many, many benefits of engaging responsibly in kink activities. I mean, when you're in the middle of a role play, all of the complexities of your day-to-day -day life just melt away because there are more impressing things to attend to, such as chasing a ball or getting scratches or making new friends. Speaking of friends, I'm still very close with the person Tiger Pup met that first night. And I'm even wearing one of the beautiful colors she gifted me. And when we are together, she still acts as a handler for Tiger Pup, filling up water bowls and checking in on me. I have been, even been up to stay with her in Brisbane, where she introduced me to some of the Queensland Pups and Handlers group, who are an absolutely incredible bunch of people and pups. Tiger Pup continues to make friends everywhere she goes. She is stronger than I, which is why I needed her help tonight. And I can't help but think about how lucky I am to have something to do on a Saturday night that doesn't leave me with a hangover. <laughs> Loving Tiger Pup has been a big part of my journey of learning to love myself. And I hope you can all find the things that can do that for you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you 
so much, Tiger, for sharing your love with us and for reminding all of us to keep honouring deeply the things that we adore because our longing is legitimate and we all deserve our deepest pleasures to be recognised. Rayleigh Lancaster has a dual career. Firstly, as an information services professional, and secondly, as a writer, collaborator, and creative producer. Rayleigh's writing has been published widely in newspapers and journals, and in anthologies including Firefront, First Nations Poetry, Power Today, and the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. In 2018, Rayleigh was awarded first place for the Nakata Brophy Prize for Young Indigenous Writers. And in 2019, Rayleigh was a recipient of a copyright agency, First Nations Fellowship. Can you join me in welcoming Rayleigh? Hi, um, I am Rayleigh. Um, I am a Libra, um, which makes me prettier than everyone here. <laughs> um, I got my first boyfriend when I was 13. Got him as if he were a new toy to play with. In some cases, he was. He was my friend's brother two years older and, now that I think about it, not very attractive at all. <laughs> After two weeks of going out, he sent me a text that broke my fragile heart. Our entire relationship had been a joke between him and his friends. After this, I did what any teen girl with a fiction obsession and a Tumblr account in 2008 would do. I found solace in fan fiction and wrote a soppy romantic story about a vampire and a bird man falling in love. <laughs> the story was a short one chapter or one shot set in the world of the young adult vampire fantasy series House of Night with main characters Stevie Ray Johnson, a fledgling vampire priestess, and Rephahim, an angelic monster who appeared part human, part foul. <laughs> this is that story. <laughs> Rephahim had risked his life to save mine on numerous occasions. But right now, I needed to risk myself and everything I believed in to save him. I hated lying to Zoe, my best friend and savior of the red fledgling vampires. But he is what matters to me the most. More than my own life or the fate of the world, Rephahim's wing was broken. He was so helpless. I felt so drawn to him. To me, he wasn't one of Kelowna's evil spawn, nor was he my enemy. I mean, sure, he tried to kill my best friend. <laughs> but let's face it, who hasn't? To me, he was beautiful and kind. I stayed with him until his wing healed. I would sneak him food and water. I watched him, studied him. He was so graceful, even when hurt. Slowly, I fell in love. It was a cold morning around 3 a.m. I snuck down to the tunnels where Rephahim was hiding. He was standing up stretching his wings, his chest muscles flexed, sending a pleasurable shiver down my spine. <laughs> he, 
He was gorgeous. His wings were large sheets of ebony feathers, flexing, stretching, healing. His beak was strong and his jaw was chiseled. <laughs> A cool breeze ran through the tunnels, carrying his scent toward me. He smelt like sunshine. <laughs> I gave a soft sigh. Quickly, he spun around, tensed as if ready to be attacked. Once he saw me, he relaxed slightly. I handed him some food and water. He snatched it and swallowed in a matter of seconds. He thanked me, eyeing the canteen in my hand. His voice was raspy and stale, like the bread he had just devoured. <laughs> so I lifted the canteen to his beak and the cool, refreshing liquid ran down his gullet, <laughs> moistening his dry throat. <laughs> Why are you so good to me, he asked, after gulping down the last of the water. Well, I said, pausing seductively. <laughs> you helped me, so it's only right that I help you. That still doesn't answer my question, he said, his voice deep and thick like sex. <laughs> I sighed. Haven't you ever felt drawn to someone? Like they're the only reason you breathe every day. Like the world wouldn't be worth living if it weren't for this person. Rafahim took, took a second to think before shaking his head. My heart is as cold and hard as ice. <laughs> and my soul is darker than your worst nightmares. I have seen, heard, done things that are inexcusable, as if any woman would want any of that. I took his face into my hands and investigated his glossy ebony eyes. I do, I whispered, and then kissed his smooth beak. <laughs> At 13, I thought Stevie Ray was badass. The priestess of a subgroup of vampires with a birdman boyfriend. How cool. <laughs> For my teenage self, female empowerment was always tied to a male protagonist whose main mission was to protect his girl, even if she was totally capable of doing it herself. Like a lot of people muddling through their sexuality, I went from zero to sexually aggressive in no time flat before simmering down in my 20s after realizing I leaned more toward the asexual side of the spectrum. A few years after writing vampires who share my name and sexy bird men, I was reading the very popular Twilight fan fiction, Master of the Universe by Snow Queen's Ice Dragon. This story would later be pulled and republished as a piece of original fiction called Fifty Shades of Grey, to which I still have the PDF if anyone wants it. <laughs> Based on the fan fiction I wrote around this time, it'd be true to say that Master of the Universe heavily inspired me with its raunchy sex scenes and bad BDSM vibes. Many of the stories featured queer relationships, especially those between men. This, this genre, referred to as slash in the fanfiction community, was usually a straight woman's genre that was violent and voyeuristic. I wrote the following excerpt for my friend Rebecca's 16th birthday. At the time, I was still a virgin and had never touched nor seen a real-life penis. 
nor did I wish to. <laughs> this story is a piece of slash fan fiction between Stark, a vampire from the House of Night series, and Patch, an angel from the Hush Hush series, which centered around fallen angels and reincarnation. <clears throat> Stark wraps his arms around Patch's waist, pulling him tightly against his hard body. Changing the angle of his face, Patch roughly grasps Stark's hair, pulling his concubine down for a passionate kiss. The two men bite and nip at one another, their bodies entwined in a heated embrace, melding into one being. Patch has a rough exterior due to horrific past events. <laughs> Serious stuff. Both men have tall, well-built physiques, dark hair and eyes, and they both dress in all black. Bad boys. These things add to their mysterious allure and make them stunningly attractive to the opposite sex. Too bad for all their female admirers because they pitch for the other team. <laughs> Patch moves his hands from their place around Stark's neck, sliding them down to the waistband of Stark's jeans. Stark gasps as Patch slips his hands beneath Stark's jeans and begins massaging his ass. <laughs> Both men moan deeply and start kissing again, their passion escalating with each touch. Patch pulls away from his lover, both panting as if they'd just run a marathon. Once undressed, Patch and Stark slide back onto the bed. Patch crawls towards Stark like a wildcat stalking its prey. <laughs> Tenderly caressing his lover's face, Stark pulls him down, tracing Patch's lips with his tongue. <laughs> Patch devours Stark's lips with his own, <laughs> his hands exploring his paramour's naked body and then they have Fifty Shades themed sex for the next 2,000 words. <laughs> At 27, I look back on this period of my life with great fondness. The fan fiction community provided me the comfort and camaraderie I lacked in real life. However, while fan fiction offered solace it also furthered many stereotypes, like the somewhat homophobic gaze of women writing gay male sex. And I was complicit, and still am, in all of it. It took time for me to realize that I can, I can love the joy and healing fan fiction can bring while also being critical of the form itself. While my romantic heart has not dissipated, my forays into fan fiction writing have become more political, exploring the intersections of indigeneity and queerness. And if you find any of these stories online, or find out my username on <laughs> fanfiction.net, Wattpad, archive of our own, or Tumblr, never let me know. <laughs> Save it to the deepest, darkest parts of your mind to remember and laugh at when you're on a bus or at a funeral or something. <laughs> and remember, if you can't find a partner to love you for you, you can always create a fictional one. <laughs> Thank you. Firstly, fuck that guy. <laughs>
secondly, I wish my voice could be deep and thick like sex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your nostalgic deep dive because it made me remember my own Dawson's Creek fan fiction <laughs> that I wrote la no that I wrote when I was 14. <laughs> Emil Kanita is a queer Filipino Australian storyteller currently living in Nam. Emil uses their body and social media account to explore different themes surrounding human sexuality, queer relations, and as a diary of someone who is HIV positive, uh, who is a HIV positive person of colour living in post-AIDS Australia. There is a content warning for sexual assault, trauma responses, and sex in this story. Can you please join me in welcoming Emil? Hello. Um, I don't think I'll need this one. Um, so, name is Emil. Pronouns are he, she, and they. Clearly, I'm a Leo. <laughs> uh, I'm also Leo Rising, so again, hello. Um, and uh, Baby Spice, clearly. Uh, so, my piece uh, is titled um, Just a Whole, Sir. But I want to start my story with a game, so it's going to need some involvement from all of you. So I hope you do play along. Uh, it's a game called Two Truths and One Lie. It's quite simple. So I'll tell three different facts, and all you need to do is guess which one is a lie. It's simple. OK, cool. So are you ready? Yes. Great. So the first one is my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> is a professional singer in Hong Kong and sang at one of Jackie Chan's parties. First one. Second is that my uncle is an award winning Elvis Presley impersonator in Southeast Asia. And last and certainly not the least, um, I've sucked off 562 dicks through a glory hole in the past 10 months. <laughs> so if you think it's the first one is the lie, you gotta raise your hand. So my mom sang at Jackie Chan's party in Hong Kong. No? One person. One person thinks a lie. Second, uh, my uncle is an award-winning Elvis Presley impersonator. <laughs> oh, wow. OK, great. Thank you. And then the last, um, yeah, I've sucked off 562 dicks through a glory hole in the past 10 months. <laughs> That's a lie. Great. So <laughs> the lie is um, I didn't suck off 562 dicks through a glory, ho through a glory hole in the past 10 months, I've sucked off 862 dicks. <laughs> Through a glory hole. Sorry, my jaw is really tired um, in the last 10 months. So add 200 more. Uh, so you're probably now wondering how, where, who, and why. To anyone who hasn't heard of a glory hole before, a glory hole is a hole made through a wall where a person can insert their genitals in with the hopes of um, being stimulated by normally an anonymous individual. According to the Center of Disease Control in both the Canada and the US, using a glory hole is also a COVID safe way to have sex during the pandemic. <laughs> safe sex. Um, now, would you believe that the glory hole was a product of therapy? Let me tell you the origin story of the now famous hole. I was raped when I was a kid, and it's taken me about 20 years to finally talk about it with someone. When I finally did, it was with my therapist, and it was about almost a year ago. Having developed chronic PTSD due to this experience, Part of the treatment course is this thing called EMDR. Has anyone heard of that before? You. Um, and it stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. EMDR is an effective form of psychotherapy that can help people who experience PTSD to reprocess their trauma. So if, um, if you're curious about how it works, essentially you start off by holding on the traumatic experience in your head 
And while focusing on it, you, get, you then get asked by your therapist to follow their hands from one side of your face to the other. After that, with the same thought in your mind, your therapist will then introduce an external stimuli. So in my case, it's usually him tapping on both sides of my knees. Um, then you basically go through this process a few times until the memory starts to dissipate. Apparently, this combination of bilateral stimulation and external stimuli can feel like that refresh button that you need on a web page when it's looking stuck and not responding. In my case, it's able to unlock and process the trauma that my mind is holding on to. As a side effect, though, you may also experience extremely vivid nightmares and for a number of days, as your subconscious processes the trauma during your sleep. I remember being so exhausted throughout this process. I was sleepless, depressed, the list, and I wasn't able to do barely any work for a whole week. Uh, luckily, I had a workplace that was very supportive and understanding. Now, what was bizarre about this whole experience was that on the fifth day of having these nightmares, I had this vivid dream of owning a glory home. I remember waking up that day having this uncontrollable urge of having one. I just had to have it, my mind kept on telling me. So without any hesitation, at 7 a.m., I messaged a couple of my queer tradie friends and asked them both if they'd be open to creating a glory hole with me. And to my surprise, within the hour, both of them said yes. <laughs> um, and after a whole day spent in Bunnings, by Sunday, I finally owned a glory hole. I didn't waste any time. As soon as my friend left, I went on Double List, which is uh, Craigslist, what it used to be, and put, up with, um, put an ad up with the words, anonymous and safe. Here to offer my lips for fun at my private glory hole close to the city. Send dick pic to play. And just like that, <laughs> in less than an hour, I had my first visitor a 27-year-old tradie who happened to be working close by. Once he arrived, I sent him the instructions on how to come up to my apartment, what number he needs to buzz, what floor he needs to get up to, and, what, and that I've left my door unlocked and to make sure that he sh takes sh um, his shoes off by the door. <laughs> we don't need to talk if they don't want to, and all they need to do is sleep themselves inside the hole. The rest is history. As soon as he's done, he can just sit up, and go. Um, now, although I was actively involved in planning the glory hole, building the glory hole, and christening it, uh, all in the same weekend, I was somehow still surprised and bewildered by, in, by its existence. When I saw my psychologist again the following week, I couldn't help, help but say, what the fuck? Why do I own a glory hole now? <laughs> Um, a part of me just wanted to shift responsibility as if the glory hole just happened to me. He said, when people are able to unlock a process or process a traumatic experience, it's very common for us to have a bodily response. He added, because it was in the middle of lockdown, um, when this was all happening, I had very limited options of how I'm able to express myself. So it only made sense that I reacted in a way that happened inside my home. Insightfully, he also said, if you think about it, this is the first time in your sex life where you're able to be playful and experiment. He was right. Before all of this, even though I was very sexually active, my body was often quite tense in bed. Like a body inside a car that's just about to crash, I'm always bracing for impact. It was also the first time in my life, as a person of color, was HIV positive, where I didn't have to navigate sexual racism and HIV stigma. Because of the anonymity and minimalism of the whole experience, in this case, because there's a literal wall uh, between me and the other person, I also found that I don't get asked stigmatizing questions like, are you clean? Or come across statements like, no fats, no femmes, no Asians. I thought to myself, is this how it feels like to be white and negative? Who knew that by reducing myself into a whole that I'm also emancipated by the trials and tribulations of identity politics. Through the glory hole, I was able to also expand my gender and explore my transness without the need to constantly pass or perform in a certain way. 
For example, when I connected with this beautiful fireman who wanted to play beyond the glory hole, I was so hesitant about showing him what I look like. When he finally did decide to take the wall down, his reaction surprised me. All I was met with was these words of adoration and desire. He was so turned on by the very sight of me, dressed up in cheap lingerie and a mask made out of lace. In Rihanna's own words, he made me feel like I'm the only girl in the world. <laughs> It was only until then that I realized how much I've subconsciously internalized the essentialism around transness. Even though I knew that I didn't need papers, tits, or medical records to know that I'm trans, a deeper part of me was in disagreement with this thought. But when I was with someone who saw me for who I am and never questioned my identity, all of my insecurities ceased to exist. I learned that I was enough. I also learned a lot of things from my visitors. Using my background in social sciences for the first few weeks, I decided to collect some data about the first 124 visitors. So these are some of the results. I found out that most of them were around the ages of 25 to 35. More than half of them work in the trade. And more than 97% of them identified as straight. I was surprised by the number of these cis straight men who were willing to share my whole with me. It made me wonder, what else can we be willing to explore if given the anonymity and safe space to explore our sexuality? From someone who works, lives, and socializes in predominantly queer spaces, through the glory hole, I've been able to look at straight cis men differently. Through this hole, I saw their vulnerability, their softness, their anxieties, their playfulness. Qualities that I've never been exposed to because for so long in my life, I've been mostly afraid of them. Through the glory hole, I've been able to challenge my own prejudice towards straightness. Who knew that straightness is so much more than what we've previously thought? That straight identities can also hold very queer desires. Through the hole, I've been able to see how trusting and generous strangers can be with one another. Through my Instagram, which you can follow at X by the way, um, where I have documented my whole glory hole journey, I was surprised by the hundreds of faceless men in uniform who have allowed me to photograph, take videos, Polaroids, and write about them, with some even more generous by allowing to share parts of our engagement together, allowing outsiders to hear their voice, understand who they are, and highlight the plurality of straightness. It still amazes me how much a piece of plank with a hole can tell so much about who we are as people, how exploring kink can be a way for us to expand our understanding of sex and, like me, can be used as a tool to overcome sexual trauma. For someone who has tried so hard not to be reduced by my race, my HIV status, and my queerness, this time, after what I've learned, I wouldn't mind calling myself just a whole sir. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty, Emil. Thank you for reminding us to commit to our healing, to our authenticity, that our sexuality is fluid and expansive, and that we all deserve to feel like we are enough. Yep. I told you Queer Stories was the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before we wrap up, I want to thank all of our performers for sharing their hearts and truth with us. I know this in my bones. It's why I love what I do, but stories matter. Their power is potent, and I was reminded again of this tonight. So thank you. I hope we all keep telling our stories. Thank you to our incredible Auslan interpreters. I think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you to Quag Goma for supporting the event, particularly Anna and Michaela and the tech team. 
If you missed the exhibition tonight, please be sure to check it out. And if you love storytelling nights like this, make sure you follow Queer Stories on Facebook and subscribe to the podcast. Also, don't forget to tell your own story by participating in the Dear Queensland project. The next Queer Stories event is, at May, is on May 29th at the Brisbane Powerhouse as part of Brisbane Comedy Festival. Tickets are on sale now. I have been your host, Claire Christian. You are all a delight. Please get home safely. Thank you.